This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So we've heard lots of inspiration and uh, wonderful uh, comments from uh, leadership. Um, now we get to um, the, I was going to say the meat of the program, but we're not allowed to say that. And it doesn't sound right to say the tofu of the program, right? So, uh, but this is, this is where we get into the, the real question of uh, what are we going to do? What does the science tell us? What are some of the options for uh, solutions? And uh, to do so, we are going to hear from a series of uh, speakers, all of whom are uh, contributing to the report as well, which you will hear again tomorrow morning from uh, Ram uh, in terms of his summary. And to begin, we have first uh, Bill Collins, um, who is a uh, well-esteemed, very esteemed climate scientist. Uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, but also at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, Bill is going to talk to us about pathways for bending the curve. Good morning. Uh, I'm representing chapter one of our report I must say before I start that it's a real honor to be back here. I launched my career at Scripps in the early 1990s. Ram didn't mention that it was under his careful tutelage that I had learned climate science. I started uh, working on climate after studying the universe, and I thought it would be good to come closer to home and bring my energies closer to home, and Ram helped me do that. So thank you very much, Ram, for your instruction. And now fast forward uh, 25 years later, and here I'm back again. We're going to be looking at a chapter of this report that deals with three issues. And I'm sorry to say I have to start with a somewhat sobering assessment of the state of the climate. Before I do that, I want to mention to you that I, I am an optimist, and an optimist because I know we can bend the curve and because of the energy of the people in this room. But we have to start off with sort of a, a quick tour of what's happening then talk about the urgency of bending the curve, and then finally some options that we discussed in our chapter, which actually focus a lot on short-lived climate pollutants. 2015 is on pace to be the warmest year uh, in modern th uh, thermometric uh, records of the climate system. So records that go back 135 years. Established 2015 <coughs> as possibly being the warmest year. 2014 was certainly the warmest year Nine of the 10 warmest years have occurred in this century. And since Ron was appealing to those in the gallery, I have to do so as well. None of you have lived, I'm sorry to say, in what would be regarded as, as historically normal climate. Everyone we teach in our classes has now been born in a different world from the one that many of their professors grew up in. And this is one of the major challenges that we face. Now, if we could run the movie, thank you. California snowpack has fallen dramatically over the last five years. 2015 was the record low in recent uh, memory and in recent records. Now, some of this may not be directly attributable to global warming, but it is certainly a foretaste of what will happen, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later in my talk, uh, as thermodynamics rules our rainfall and snowpack and converts more of that snow to rain later in the century. But the, the fact that we have such low snowpack this year, and in fact, we've had several years where many of our historically snow-capped mountains have been bare from snow, as seen from space, is really a reflection of how much our climate has changed and what we have to look forward to. Drought is extreme to exceptional over most of California. And the, uh, this is reflected 
in very low water levels in many of our critical reservoirs, 30%, and many of them across the state. This picture that you see on the left is the drought monitor uh, that I just downloaded last week from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And it shows that most of the state is, is really in an exceptional drought condition. Now again, I don't want to necessarily attribute this to climate change, but it is a harbinger of how much changes to our water cycle can affect our daily lives. It's also a good chance to point out that the state has risen dramatically to the challenge posed to it by Governor Brown. He asked us to cut our, our water consumption by 25%. We uh, met or exceeded that goal across much, much of the state. Uh, and this has been a real testament to the ability of Californians to act in concert when the need arises. And I think it's a very good prelude for the kind of challenges that we heard about this morning and that we'll be facing in the near future. So that's kind of a quick tour, and I'm, I'm, that was very California-centric. I recognize you, impacts are happening all over the world. Let's focus then on, on California's contribution to global warming. As people have already pointed out, it's relatively small, it's 1%. We actually are slightly more carbon intensive than the world, uh, about 85%, uh, 84% of our energy comes from, uh, and, uh, and our emissions are associated with carbon dioxide. That's about 75% globally. Uh, the um, challenge for us is that we're living as part of that global system where, as Ron mentioned, global emissions are increasing at 2% a year. And so it's very critical for us, even though we're a small part of that, to act as a very big uh, fulcrum arm on bending those emissions to the point where they go to zero and then go negative. We also heard from Helena that another major contributor to global warming are short-lived uh, climate pollutants. Short-lived here means, as she mentioned, all the way from days for black carbon to weeks for ozone to about a, a decade for methane. This diagram on the left is from a, a paper by uh, Ram uh, and colleagues that shows the relative contributions of carbon dioxide, black carbon, and then a mix of other greenhouse gases to global warming. And you can see that black carbon actually is a, is a pretty big contributor. The, the size of the circles is their relative contribution to radiative forcing. So that means that these short-lived climate pollutants are very important actors in warming the climate. And that's also evidenced by the fact that their global warming potential, uh, this is the figure on the right, which is a measure of how much they contribute to forcing, is comparable to that of carbon dioxide on timescales of one to two decades. The good news is that because they have a short lifetime, once you begin to ameliorate their emissions, you can rapidly extract them from the Earth's atmosphere. And we'll come back to why this is such a good idea a little bit later uh, in this presentation. So now, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to come back to a slightly sobering part of the talk, which deals with what happens if we don't bend the curve. And I, I'd like to think of this sort of in the context of Dickens' Christmas Carol, that um, you know, we'll all wise up if we see what the future could look like. And I, this, this future that I'm presenting is one that is slightly, actually slightly more optimistic than business as usual, but it's still pretty sobering. So these are figures taken from a couple of different sources. One of them is California on the right, shows heat, uh, the number of heat waves, the frequency of them in Oakland, uh, close to where I live. And the diagram on the left is the mean temperature for California at the year 2100. California temperatures can increase by five to six degrees Celsius, which is completely historically unprecedented. And as a consequence, it could trigger much more frequent heat waves, uh, increased by a factor of 15. Now, we've been talking a lot about um, impacts on sort of the physical climate system, but heat waves are actually quite dangerous from a health perspective. And they pose a major risk to uh, both the human population and also to the, the, uh, to the animals and uh, plants living in our natural surroundings. It's very critical that we avoid this type of impact uh, by bending the curve. One of the other impacts that higher temperatures have on ecosystems is that they shorten winters. Now, this might sound good if you're a farmer, but it has it had a completely drastic impact on our forests by enabling beetles and other pests to have much longer breeding seasons. Uh, Ram and I both uh, worked during part of our career in Boulder, Colorado. The forests west of Boulder now have two 
uh, complete life cycles of beetles in the trees every year. Not one, two, thanks to the longer growing season, and that has decimated the forests across much of the American Southwest. So it's, this, has, uh, this longer growing season definitely is a double-edged sword. We're not sure what's gonna happen with rainfall in California. The storm tracks will definitely move north. That will make Canada wetter. It will make Mexico drier. Uh, but at the moment, our climate models are still not able to reliably predict what's going to happen uh, in California. In fact, we're still don't, not sure whether the, the, the signal is statistically significant at timescales of a century. And that's, that's the white regions that you see in these diagrams. It's basically where the, the models are giving us a coin toss as to what's going to happen. But the models are quite sure that thanks to the fact that snow melts when you heat it and you stick it in a warmer climate, warmer by five or six degrees Celsius, we're gonna see dramatically lower snowpack by the end of the century. And it could decline by as much as 80%. That's going to cause stream flow in our rivers, on which we vitally depend, to start to plunge by the year 2050, perhaps by 25% uh, or more. Uh, in some other river basins, the signal is much larger. And agriculture, which uses 70% of the water in the state of California, or 80%, depending on who you, uh, whose county you believe, could be one of the most dramatically affected sectors, uh, thanks to this dramatically reduced uh, snowpack and water availability. We should also mention sea level rise. And this is an issue which has both a, an impact, an economic impact, but also a major climate equity impact because of settlement patterns, particularly in the ones I'm familiar with are in the Bay Area. If you look at what would happen if sea level rose by one and a half meters, which is sort of between the, the consensus and the upper bound of estimates coming out of the IPCC report, and is consistent with other estimates that have been published since, and couple that with a major storm, and just look at the Bay Area, not to be parochial, but this is where I live, you take out 1,300 miles of roads in the, in the Bay Area, thanks to a storm like that. Uh, both airports would be taken down temporarily, flooded. Uh, that would exceed the, the seawall around the San Francisco airport. Um, it would uh, impact a large number of people. Damages statewide could run into the tens of billions of dollars. And the climate e equity issue here is that many of the poorest people who live, uh, of the seven million who live in the Bay Area, live down close to sea level for example, uh, just immediately east of the Port of Oakland. And they are ground zero for the impacts of dramatically increased sea level rise. So this is an, an issue that's important for all sectors of society. So let's now talk about the prospects for bending the curve. Uh, this, this curve, it doesn't look actually much like a curve, it's a very straight line. It uh, comes out of the summary for policymakers for the uh, last IPCC report, the fifth assessment, and it shows the relationship between cumulative carbon emissions and, uh, on the horizontal axis and temperature on the vertical. And you can see that we're just walking this straight path to a dramatically uh, different climate. Uh, there's historical data on here. There are climate projections. They all point to a future where we really do not want to go. Um, the challenge for us in bending this curve is that about half the carbon that's been emitted since the start of industrialization, this, the invention of the steam engine in 1780, has been emitted in roughly the last half century. So we have a, a lot of work to do to uh, begin altering this curve. Uh, and, but we must, because the carbon commitment and the commitment of the uh, chlorofluorocarbons that Rama alluded to earlier will last for centuries to millennia. So it's time to get started. And the good news is that, uh, as Elena mentioned, there are some pathways that allow us to rapidly get some traction on this problem while we sort out the carbon issue. The carbon issue is particularly tricky because it's so deeply embedded in our energy systems. And the, the, frankly, the energy intensity in fossil fuels is 100 times, 50 times higher than, than ordinary batteries. It's very hard to replace fossil fuels currently. It's going to take us a while to figure that out. But in the meantime, we can tackle some of these short-lived climate pollutants and have a major impact uh, on uh, buying time for the harder problems. This is a, a figure uh, from a, a paper by Schumacher et al. that appeared and showed uh, basically how much you can lower temperature. Lana mentioned that it's 
uh, six tenths of a degree um, by 2050, much larger as you look out on longer time horizons. If you go from a reference or business as usual solution, which is the blue curve in this diagram, to the red, lowest red curve where you've taken out um, many of the major short-lived climate pollutants. So this has a very positive impact. And it actually, as I'll show you in a moment, comes with a number of major fringe benefits. So this is, this is a win-win-win situation all around. One thing that's important to note and that our, our chapter makes clear, this is an, another, uh, another way of looking at the problem in terms of sea level rise, um, is that you need to start right now. This is a point that Ron made very clearly. We have a narrow window, 25 years or so, in which to really get some traction on this problem. Um, if you delay beyond that, then the impacts of climate change really start to take hold. This is from a, a nice study which looked at the issues of sea level rise and pointed out that if you delay even by 25 years, you've already lost uh, about, 30, about a third of the benefit from starting to tackle these short-lived climate pollutants. But tackling short-lived climate pollutants can not only lower the temperature, as shown on the left, it can also reduce sea level rise. And that is a major benefit for the state of California. Other benefits that come from, uh, from reducing short-lived climate pollutants so as I've mentioned, you reduce the climate forcing, that's shown on the left. You also can reduce uh, human deaths by on the order of millions, on, uh, depending on what time horizon you look at. Very large positive economic benefits measured in the trillions of dollars. You offset the loss of uh, tens of millions of tons of food crops. Food does not respond well to high temperatures. And so lowering the short-lived climate pollutants buys you lower climate forcing, buys you better human health outcomes, buys you higher crop yields, buy, buys you actually a more vibrant economy. There's uh, no, there are very few downsides to tackling these pollutants. I won't deal with this in the interest of time and go on to point out that uh, California has actually been a leader in this area. We heard about this this morning. Uh, the figure here is actually from a report that Rom did a couple of years ago uh, for the state, for the uh, California Air Resources Board. Pointing out, and, and the, the point of that graph is to show how emissions of carbon and concentrations of carbon have dropped as a function of time, thanks to the dramatic controls that California has introduced. And these, these controls have a very large positive impact, again, for both human health and also for reducing climate forcing. This message has now been taken up um, around the world. So the US is taking action, Norway is taking action, Europe is taking action. We heard about the, the, the positive work that the Cl uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition is undertaking. Mexico, to, Mexico, just south of us, is undertaking action. This is fantastic. But we have a major challenge in front of us, and it's really aiming for zero emissions. We have to get to zero. Since 80, uh, roughly 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels, this means a complete radical transformation of how we produce energy, how we consume it, how we interact with our natural environment. Uh, and that's the reason why it's actually a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, we heard about the, the, the greatest generation uh, from the Second World War. I frankly think that we're about to see the next greatest generation undertake this challenge. So with that, let me conclude. We have a major challenge in front of us, thanks to climate change. It's essential to bend the curve now. Conventional barriers to action can be uh, overcome by really concerted action. Fortunately, a lot of it coming from bottom-up coalitions, such as the one we're talking about forming. And those this, this transformations will be beneficial not only to us and to the generations yet to come, but for our society and our natural environment. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to the rest of this meeting. Thank you, Bill. We have time uh, for questions. Yes, Nancy. Um, Bill, you pointed out that California. There should be. Excuse me, Nancy. There should be roving mics. Do we have those? <laughs> if, if not, I'll repeat the question. So. I, um, you pointed out that California has made some big progress in, mm -hmm. in at least black carbon. In terms of the other short-lived climate pollutants. Mm -hmm. How much more can California do, and how significant would it be just uniquely mm -hmm. to California beyond the globe? So the question was, what can California do beyond black carbon? 
and I'm happy to say that Governor Brown has put together a comprehensive plan that deals with uh, several of the other short-lived pollutants, including methane. Um, and so the state is taking, uh, taking quick action and, and actually has plans to reduce methane emissions by, I've forgotten the exact number, someone here would know, but it's in the tens of percent on a very short time horizon. So the state is now moving its attention to other short-lived pollutants. Thank you very much for that interesting talk. You mentioned that replacing hydrocarbon fuels was a much harder problem. Mm -hmm. What makes that a much harder problem? Well, the, the, the issue is energy density. Um, so you think about launching an airplane, uh, 747 on takeoff has 40,000 uh, 40, pounds of fuel on it. And it's very hard using conventional technology to, f to get an, uh, an, an equivalent amount of energy density loaded into the wings of a 747. So uh, air, uh, aviation is one place where that energy density is absolutely critical. Fortunately, there are a lot of other th uh, places where that energy is not so critical. And we had the pleasure of riding down here this morning in an electric bus. Ground transportation is one place where it's, you don't need uh, high energy density because you're not trying to at least uh, conventionally, not when you're operating a ground-based vehicle, you're not trying to take off. So that's a good thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's, it's the energy density. You're essentially using a legacy, you know, uh, legacy investment of nature in producing a really phenomenally concentrated form of solar energy that's been converted to chemical potential energy. Um, we just need to figure out how to replace that and how to store it. It's doable, but it's hard. I have a question for you, Bill, regarding the, uh, uh, not just the action on the short-lived uh, climate pollutants, but mm -hmm. probably also the larger carbon issue. If we look at the uh, Montreal Protocol, which dealt with the uh, emission of refrigerants and aerosol sprays, that was a very successful mm -hmm. undertaking in terms yes. of, of the action that mm -hmm. resulted. And, and I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I understand that, that the involvement of industry at that time was crucial to that success. That is, they were at the negotiating table, and companies such as Dow Chemical were developing alternative products in parallel with this. What's the prospect for repeating the success of that with regard to, say, the short-lived climate pollutants? So the, um, in many cases, in many cases, the, the, there's no particular um, reason why industry couldn't tackle, for example, the, the soot issue. I mean, soot is, is sort of a, it's, um, it's an inadvertent product of combustion, of diesel combustion. It's actually, an, as I understand it, not that difficult to remove from the waste stream for, from combustion. And the, uh, the, the question then is, why would industry be interested in undertaking this? How, how does it help their business model? Um, let's take methane as an example. Uh, all the methane that's being leaked from, uh, from transmission systems and from systems that are removing it from the ground is, waste, is wasted dollars. So industry has a direct incentive to reduce leaks from uh, fossil, from, uh, particularly from natural gas systems. So, there, uh, you incentivize them and maybe they'll, they'll go tackle the problem. Currently, we have an issue with methane in the United States. The, the concentrations that we measure at ground level are several times higher than what EPA thought using their, their analysis. So it's clear that we have a lot of inadvertent emission, uh, emission of methane and that's got to be brought under control. Okay. We have time for just one last question. Yes, in the back. Hi, so uh, you mentioned that California contributes about 1% of mm -hmm. the global emissions, and I'm wondering um, if we can historicize that a little bit, if we have an idea of what our historical contribution has been to this, because that seems like part of the urgency that we need to create for moving forward is that we may be partially responsible for something a little more. That's right, so you're asking actually about sort of the, the carbon commitment from the developed world. Is that, I mean, we can talk about California but uh, the, the carbon commitment from the developed world is really the, um, the, you know, one of the central sticking points uh, behind reaching a, a negotiation. You know, the tricky thing, I was just talking to Ray Weiss uh, this morning before we started, and, and the, many of our policies in California are framed around understanding how much we were emitting in 1990. It's, it's surprising how poor the data is, so I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to give you a direct answer. There are estimates. Um, but the, the point that Ray was making and with which I agree is that we now need to move into a mode where we are actively 
and constantly monitoring the climate system with much greater fidelity than we're currently doing. And this means really carefully tracking the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. We actually have, we, we don't have great information about, um, about California's contributions back in 1990. Um, we, can, we can guess probably to a leading, leading order, uh, but we don't have good data, and that's, that's true more broadly. Okay, let's thank Bill once again for a very stimulating talk. <laughs>